So we'll be announcing all the details and the timing of all of this coming shortly, a month to two months. Um, watch the website. Uh, the dealers will be notified first in the Digifax that they all get, and then it'll appear on the website one day. And if you are on our Digitrax email list, you will get an email letting you know that the new thing is, is about to be released. So sign up for the email list on the website if you have not done so already. Next. Oh, the No Worries Warranty. We're still reminding people that we now have what's called a No Worries Warranty. Everything that we sell you is warranted for a year. If it breaks, send it back. Um, we do ask that you follow some simple instructions uh, when you send things back. Contact tech support or check the website and see if you can find out what the problem is before you send it in. We get an incredible amount of product returned to us when people say that there's a problem. When we test it in the shop, we find there's no problem. CVs need to be reset sometimes. CV 8 to 8 is a great thing that resets all the CVs back to factory defaults and will get you back up and running again. It is possible to program some of your CVs in a way so that the train won't move for a long, long time. And that is sometimes confused with the dead to cover. So check that out first. Uh, on digitracks.com, you can go in, fill out the repair form. That lets us know who you are, where you are, how to get in touch with you to ask you a question if you need to, and where to send it back when we're done with it. So if you would fill out that repair form, it helps us an awful lot when it gets back to the shop. We still get things that come back for repair that people don't put their name on. They don't put a return address on the, on the package. And if that happens, and you have sent in a repair and it's been a long time, give us a call and talk to the repair um, clerk, Brenda. She will look on that shelf where all those things go and find out if your item is there. Uh, package your product securely. Do not send it to us in a paper envelope. The post office bites the heads off of those and throws the decoders we don't know where. Once a month, we get a, an envelope back with the end torn off and no decoder. And that's not fun for anybody. So, packaging securely. Send it to us using a trackable carrier, especially if it's a throttle or a command station or something expensive. If you put it in the mail, the US mail, um, they don't have to really help you track it, unfortunately until it's been 14 days missing or 60 days missing or whatever, however you sent it. But in some cases, it can be as much as 60 days before they'll even start looking. So if it's something that matters a lot to you, please use UPS or FedEx or some way that you can track the package. Because we can't be responsible for it until it gets to us. So just get it there to us safely. Um, we cannot accept UPS shipments from Canada any longer because of the the problems that we've had with UPS uh, customs charges being reversed to us on several packages. So if you are sending it from Canada, Canada Post is much better than US Post about getting things to us. Uh, they have a superior postal service in every way. <laughs> so send that, if you're from Canada, send it back by mail. If you're in the US, send it by UPS. Don't trust the US Postal Service. Um, all this stuff, a lot of people will call and say, oh, this seems like such a burden to have to fill out this form and everything. But really and truly, it's just a way that we can be sure that you receive your product back in a timely manner, fixed in the way that you want it to be fixed. If you are sending something in and you send it in for warranty, for the, under the one-year warranty, we do ask that you send a copy of your receipt so we can verify how long we've had it. If we receive it without anything letting us know that um, it's bought within the last year, a lot of times you'll get a phone call or an email saying, please send us that information. And any, whatever you've got, send it in so we can get it done under warranty. And if it's not under warranty, the, the fees are not that, that much. Yes, Marty? A lot of times if you have not saved your receipt, your dealer will have it in his uh, POS system. He can go to your dealer and he can print a receipt out for you. That is true. So another good reason to keep those dealers around. Right. Product announcements. Coming to the show, everybody's saying, what are you going to announce at the show? What are you going to announce at the show? 
Well, we're trying not to do a lot of product announcements at shows anymore because we don't want to wait for a show and have products announced only at shows. We think it's best to go ahead and have things ready to go in production when we announce them to cut down disappointment. We all, we all know, and Digitrax has done this in the past, we've announced a product and then it's taken longer than we projected. In some cases, a lot longer to, than we projected. <laughs> And sometimes it's through no fault of our own, sometimes it is our fault, but in order to cut that down, we are trying to have things ready to go when we announce them. Now, that said, we just violated that cardinal rule and announced something that is not ready to go just yet. But it is a, that is an opportunity for everybody to have input on that product before it gets to the field. So we thought it was more important to talk to experienced model railroaders about the interface on this iPad app that we thought we should go ahead and announce it now and let everybody have their say while we were still in development. And we're far enough along with it that it's not going to be that long, I'm pretty sure. So, for new product announcements, watch our website, sign up for the um, Digitrax uh, email list. We are emailing now when we make product announcements to end users. If you are getting emails that you don't want to receive, go ahead and click unsubscribe. It will not hurt our feelings at all. We do it all the time when we're getting a lot of emails we don't need to get. So um, that, that's how we're announcing new products. Okay. Ah, the Q&A session. This is the time when you guys get to ask all the questions you want. We'll stay as long as you like. Um, anybody who um, needs to leave at any time, we will not be offended if you get up and, and leave. Sometimes the questions get pretty technical. If you feel that the question has become too technical and is really off topic for the group, I would ask you to raise your hand and wave it around in the air. If I get enough people raising their hand and waving it around in the air, I will stop the discussion and move that discussion to um, one of the guys in the back. If it's specific to a specific layout and other people want to move on to other topics, that will allow us to, to keep things moving and keep um, get everybody a chance to get their questions answered. Okay, so those are those are the basic rules of the game. Uh, we had somebody email in this question, and this is his email uh, word for word. So let me let me read it to you. This is from Bob Fry. He usually comes to the convention, but he was not able to join us tonight, so he wanted this question answered. He said, the Digitrax tech support has stated to the Sound Forum Group that no firmware update for the SDH-164D product, there is no firmware update for the SDH-164D product. They are getting inquiries about it and don't know where this false information came from. His question is, does Digitrax know that the SDH-164D product is being returned from users and dealers with a reason for the return by the customer? The response from Digitrax customer repair is, quote, no problem found, with a suggestion of turn back EMF off, which could be considered a firmware update. With your no problem found returns of the SDH-164D, do you have any suggestions for your dissatisfied sound customers? Hmm. Okay, so he, he has a valid question. And I, I don't know that I would consider turning off back EMF a software upgrade because the software hasn't changed. It's just a matter of turning off back EMF <sighs> and those phones. Uh, turning off back e the back EMF uh, CV that, that controls back EMF. So that's just a suggestion for um, for how to handle that problem. Now, AJ wanted to talk for a minute about the SDH-164D and the no problem found items that are coming back. So take it away, AJ. He designed it, he can talk to you about it. Okay, uh, going on about the 164D in particular, the, we've looked at a number of units that have been sent back and I, when I see some sort of stuff come back in that's uh, different to what we've seen before, I take, typically have a pretty close look at it. We took a long look at a number of units when the repair people actually go through and test it, that it works to the original uh, design specs, and they all tested fine. So they ended up on my desk, and I've been through a, a handful of them. And what it appears to be is the unit, the SDH-164D, was designed to run with a 32-ohm speaker for various 
you know, various reasons. And basically, if you run it with a low impedance speaker, you can do that, it won't damage the decoder, but what you'll find is, because the extra power draw with a much lower impedance speaker than it was optimally designed for, you're going to in interfere with the back EMF operation, okay? And that's why we find that if somebody's had that problem, we usually suggest turn off back EMF, which is setting CV57 to zero, the problem goes away. So it's not actually a design flaw in the decoder, it's the fact in everyone I've seen to date, it has been the speaker impedance is too low for the designed value the decoder was designed for. Okay, so you can use an 8-ohm speaker, you're just going to have to turn on back EMF or keep your volume down. Because what happens is as you crank the volume up, you end up overloading the power supply in the decoder. It doesn't damage it, it just means that it's going to cause some problem with back EMF. And most people don't need the back EMF, so it's a very simple thing to turn off and problem solved. The correct answer is to use the proper speaker for that particular installation. Now it comes down to people who crank up the volume way high, because the impedance is much lower, the current gets much higher than the decoder was designed for. And most people are turning the volume up because as you get older, it's harder to hear, I guess. Is that true, Dave? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But basically, the transducer efficiency is the key item in obviously HON scale. Because you've got such a small transducer trying to couple energy into the air to give you sound pressure level. You think the only way to fix it is increase the volume or increase the power. The problem is a lot of these small speakers are not designed for higher power levels. And in this case, the decoder is not designed to have the sort of currents that occur with an 8 ohm speaker. And that particular decoder does not like it. So looking back at the, all the ones I've ever looked at, once we know they've been through test and all the motor decoder functions are correct, the functions work, the um, motor works fine, and then we check with the speaker and we find that it's an 8 ohm, we know it's a problem. If it isn't, we test it with a 32 and it works fine. So that's the particular issue we've had with the STH-164Ds. And I do not believe that a changing a CV is a firmware upgrade. Personal opinion, you know, we can discuss that, but that's what we see. Anyway, that's what I've seen having a look at the supposed failure mode. Once you run it back through the garden and check everything, the decoders are fine and there is really no problem found. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. please. Follow okay. must have read my mind because this was my main question. I have, first on the good side, I have installed about 20 of these, and I really like these decoders. I think they're good for the price. Okay. Um, they've all run pretty well. Unfortunately, most locomotives don't want to accommodate that 28 millimeter speed, and so I've had to unsolder and you know, I began to run into the 8 ohm problem when we pushed the horn. And in the latest batch of these that, that came out uh, November, December, when you push the horn, some really wild things happened without even adjusting the volume. You know, some of them would reverse and stop. And so, one simple thing I'm looking for, because I, I don't want to go back to some of my locomotives and pull these out. Can you point me in the direction? 32-ohm speaker that's a small oval one because I have looked, I have spent some money buying them and, and you know, sight and seeing, you read through, you try to understand the descriptions and you end up with things and you look at them and you go, oh, this isn't going to work. And I'm presuming, because I've read all the threads on this thing, I turned the back EM off, it, off. It's worked fine on some of the locomotives. It, it created problems on other locomotives. You have to basically uh, run your throttle up. And now you can get So what I'm looking for is where I can buy the particular model numbers of some 32-ohm mobile speakers that are smaller and let's say equivalent to the soundtracks, um, 0.56 by 1 inch. They're, they're, I don't know if they call them, they're mini. And I'm guessing that you guys have probably received enough complaints that you have done some research and that there are some compatible 32 ohm speakers that are smaller. Because quite frankly, that 28 millimeter speaker does not fit the majority of locomotives that Yeah, I, I tend to agree that obviously the 28 millimeters is fine in the diesel tank of HO, for example, and 
it's okay in an F40, which is the Cardo model. So in fact, the 28 millimeter was originally used in the three um, Cardo locomotives, the AC4400, the SD38-2, and the uh, F40PH. So that was the original um, background for the 30, 30, 28 millimeter speaker. So we have a hole, I agree, we have a hole in our product line for a 28 millimeter in the width that would go in a diesel tank, which is about 20 millimeter maximum width or 18. So that's something that Zane has been looking at. So we agree with that. In the interim, if the unit is not malfunctioning with the factory original 32 ohm, then that's, a, that's the issue. If with the 32 ohm original factory speaker, it's misbehaving, then we need to take that one back and give you a new one. Okay, so that's a different issue. So we got a, the first part of the, the debug tree is, is it misbehaving with the 32 ohm original? If that's the case, then set it back. If not, we have to work on solutions to get you a 32 ohm speaker. Now, we have some people that have actually put like a 10, 16 ohm speaker resistor in series with the speaker. And that helps quite a bit. It lowers the volume, but it turns out the the greatest impact you can have, instead of turning up the electrical volume or the power level driving the speaker like a watt, the biggest thing is actually working on the transducer, on the cavity loading the speaker. That has far more profound effects in the sound pressure level or perceived volume than just trying to wind up a little half watt speaker to one watt, which will actually distort very very badly. So. Very, very strong um, part of the issue is making sure the transducer efficiency is as good as you can get. That is the key, okay? That is the bottom line for all of this. And you might also realize that acoustically, the ear has a logarithmic or a nonlinear response, power law response. And basically, if you go from 100 milliwatts into a speaker to one watt, you multiply by 10, the perception of volume increase is only a double. So human beings, the ears actually only see a very small increment in volume for a very, very large amount of pressure level. So we should be able to run the speaker down at 100 milliwatts, for example, which would be way out of the area of problems with getting uh, from the back EMF, power levels, the power supply of the SDH-164D. However, that also means that you need a larger transducer or a much better sound pressure um, coupling mechanism. The resonator cavity must be larger, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets into physics, and we can have physicists explain all the um, background to that, but that's just the way it seems to be. So to cut to the chase, the, the mounting of the speaker really is the most critical item on any of these So when we first found the problem with the uh, back EMF issue, we put in our notes from the, from the factory, going back a year or more, I guess, that if you have that issue and if setting back EMF to zero removes the problem, then we know that is the issue. Okay, does that answer your question? Well, kind of, but I, I, I mean, are you... You're not satisfied yet. Well, <laughs> yes, he wants a 28 ohm small, and we hear you clearly on that. It's acceptable, but it has to be smaller. Correct, yeah. And Except for F units, some of the larger ones, there's no room for a 28 millimeter. I totally agree. If you want it in the narrow body, if you want it up in the back or inside that, now you can get it in the dynamic brakes on something like, um, you know, I guess an F40 with the you know, large or the dash lines. But I think Zayna's hearing me very clearly on that. If, she, if you don't think so, come by the booth and be on Zayna in terms of you want the 32 ohm, we're, we're all ears. So, yeah, we do agree that. There are some issues with um, some of the HL locomotives. Again, most of the time, the reason we designed the original DH ones, DH84, I believe, with a nine-pin NMRA, well, sorry, the nine-pin Digitrax connector. We did that back uh, in '95, I guess, was it? Yeah, the DH84. The reason we set that with that decoder was most of the shells. You know, all the locomotive manufacturers are going from the same prints most of the time, and if you've got a particular G. You know, narrow hood width around the prime mover, depending on the shell thickness and the plastic, you're going to get a pretty consistent internal clearance. And that's what the DH84 was designed for. I think it's 760 thousandths of an inch, whatever. 
and I think it's 18 millimeters or whatever. So bottom line is, yes, we know that we need a speaker that would be much easier to install in the back upper section of a narrow hood diesel. So we're, we're hearing you on that, and I don't disagree. But thank you for saying at least you like the Dakotas, because they're really designed, if you look at the, say, the Tsunami the soundtracks, that's an excellent Dakota, okay? It's a 16-bit CD quality sound. It's, it's, you know, Steve Dutton did a great job with that Dakota. So, you know, we're not trying to compete. We're in a little different marketplace where you want okay sound at an okay price. And that's a different performance point, we feel. And we got into sound because we, a lot of our customers insist that we do it. It wasn't our first, it's not our primary business, but we do it basically to give you alternatives. It's like a smorgasbord, you can buy, you know, surround track, sound tracks or whatever, or you can buy ours. So we don't try and tell you, we're not going to try and explain to you that we've got 16 bit sound because that wasn't even the design goal for that set of products. And one other thing I would add, Go ahead. I probably installed a lot. Trying to fit in the speakers, uh, those capacitors, and then the wire into the coder, and unless you have a mini machine, which I use sometimes, uh, you are going to run out of head space, and there's not easily enough room to put all those in. I do like your, your 164 is thinner than the Tsunami TSC 1000. Yeah, and I think it tends to fit better in certain applications, although it's a different. Level of sound, but again, I think the price is pretty good. Yeah, and there is a classic problem there, and that is capacitance, which all Dakota's are going to need. Okay, you go over a dead frog or something, and guess what's going to happen? You run out of energy. Now, in a non sound environment, it really doesn't matter because the locomotive jerks slightly, you don't barely notice it. In a sound environment, it's a kiss of death because you can hear it. It's like hitting the upside of the head. So basically, all sound decoders need some sort of energy storage mechanism. And none of us have magic capacitors that anybody else can't buy, wherever, you know, whoever they're made by. So bottom line is, we've tended not to put the storage capacitors on the, mo on the motherboard with the main decoder board because, as you point out, that it's going to go somewhere and you're going to be a millimeter too high. And that's just like, it's all over. So we've avoided putting the energy storage caps. I know there's a lot of ESU, there's a lot of MRC, and some soundtracks that have got those, typically it's like 100 microfarad, um, 5 volt or 16 volt caps, and they're large. And we can buy the same caps, we can put them in the same places, but we, by the, by the, on the whole, we've tried to use a reasonably good energy density, small capacity that can be put on the roving lead. And it's, I think that's a lot cleaner solution uh, it's a lot easier to mount that somewhere. And you also have the option at that point, because you've got the leads on it, you can put a 10,000 mic capacitor on there. And you really can do that. And we still work on our programming track, even with those extreme capacitors. What it means is you can lift the track, the lift model with the track, and the sound keeps going for a while. So we felt that that flexibility of being able to mount what we factory provide, or be able to upgrade and capacitors or change it was more important than trying to make it one unit where everything's on it. So, you know, there, there's a different way of doing it. That's why we're in business. You only have competitors that do things differently, and that's a choice that you can make as a consumer, which way you wish to go. But thanks for the kind words. Any other questions? Okay. Well, the back EMF is something that is not actually prototypical for most American locomotives. I believe, somebody can correct me, the SD9 was the one and only one of the first American locomotives where the locomotive speed was fed back into the, the traction motors to keep a constant speed. And somebody can probably correct me on that, but that's one I've historically heard. There's only one that ever was an American prototype that has back end, uh, well, low compensation, shall we say. Uh, it was a very uh, common Amer um, European feature because they run at constant line speed with the different train lengths, and for them, they have to hold a very tight schedule with all their operations. So in the real op prototypes in Europe, they generally have some sort of low compensation. So if they're running two carriages or 45 carriages, which is not prototypical for Europe really, they would run a constant line speed. That's very critical for holding tight timetables. In this country, they just you know, hook up a couple more SD60s and they pull a few more coal, coal loads. So it's a very different operation. So the back EMF really is a um, 
feature that we added for the Europeans, and I chose to set a, a medium amount of it as a default setting. So the default for most American operations is really is zero. That's because that really is what the prototypes in this country do. You take a, a normal, um, let's forget the AC series, the AC power traction motors. With regular DC traction motors, as you load them up, they will slow down, and that's the prototype. So basically, you can use the back EMF to improve the low speed response of the gears and the stiction and the physical effects of the locomotive mechanism in the model, but it's not prototypical for American prototypes, typically. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, next. <laughs>